I would like to tell you an important issue that affects everyone on our planet, racism. More specifically, medical racism. Before we begin, allow me to place you in the life of one character who lives in a world where her hospitals are against her. The character is a female who is a first time black mother who lives in a middle class neighborhood with her mother and father. Her work only offers her the minimum maternity leave, which is a stressing factor for her. She works hard to keep her family afloat and to stay in the good neighborhood for the future of her daughter. She stays in her job despite the low insurance coverage. Because of this, she has limited options for OBGYN. Her current OB does not take her pain nor her symptoms seriously. From the stress of being a black woman, her body has experienced weathering. This is when her body has experienced psychological and physical trauma that causes health vulnerabilities and increases a person's susceptibility to infection. On the day of the delivery, she had no time to put on makeup nor get her hair tidy as it was very early. When she arrives, the anesthesiologist takes one glimpse at her and refuses to give her an epidural as he believes that she is an addict. How does he know this? Well, he thinks that she looks unkept and she has bags under her eyes and he seems to know everything about this woman's life. She gives birth in so much pain, but all of it is worth it when her baby comes out. Three weeks later, she dies. Her low grade hospital did not provide her sufficient postpartum care. They also failed to acknowledge her high blood pressure so she died from a heart attack from the stress of being medically neglected, a new mom, and a black woman. This story, though made up, actually occurs on a daily basis to many mothers from marginalized communities in the United States. This character was based on true articles I read during my research. In my talk, I am going to explore how racism deeply rooted itself into our hospitals, how racism and racial bias are currently affecting us in our modern day medical care, and how we can improve this problem. Before I begin, I want to tell you about something that will shape the way you think of this talk. In my interview with Dr. LaShawn Glasgow, the head of the Community and Workplace Health Program at the Research Triangle Institute in Durham, North Carolina, my expert, whom I sought out to get a deeper perspective on my topic, I asked her the following question. Why is there a wide mistrust of doctors coming from minority groups, especially those in African American and Latinx communities? She said that the real question is, how has the healthcare system failed to gain the trust of minority groups. This shift in perspective is what I want all of you to keep in mind as I proceed with this talk. As always, when learning something new, it is best to start at the beginning. It all started August 1619, when the first shipment of enslaved Africans was sent to the colonies. During my conversation with Dr. Glasgow, she told me that structural racism, beginning in the 1600s, has played a large role when it comes to racism in our hospitals. Our country's financial system, public system, and creation was built on the backs of slaves. From the beginning of our country, there has always been an intense oppression designed to keep those different from ever being able to achieve anything. Our systems are designed to disadvantage a certain group of people. It is dangerous how this racism has found its way into our hospitals. One of the first instances of medical discrimination happened even before a medical system was even established in America. I call to the stand Dr. J. Marion Sims, a practicing obstetrician from the 1800s. Many of you may know him as the father of gynecology as he developed many surgical techniques still used today. However, in my opinion, all of Dr. Sims' discoveries are completely undermined by the manner in which he came about his techniques. He developed his techniques on enslaved African females without their consent. To further this, he did not use any anesthesia nor antibiotics to ease the process. He used the most gruesome methods possible. Many of his supporters claim that this was because modern anesthesia was still in the works during this time. However, there is some evidence that Dr. Sims performed the same surgeries on white women in the South and did use some sort of relaxant to ease the pain. Sims believed that black women had tougher skin. Sadly, this medical myth still circulates in our modern day society, and we will talk about this effect later on. Another instance of racism in medicine before traditional medicine even existed was about a year before the Civil War ended. The study wanted to prove that white people had a larger lung capacity than that of African Americans. For the study, they used the bodies of Civil War veterans and performed spirometry tests that proved that African Americans had weaker lungs than those of whites. Plantation owners and white supremacists use this difference to justify the enslaved working in the field and other jobs. They claim that slavery helped solve all their biological differences and forced labor was a, seen as a way to 
vitalize the blood. Similar to the previous instant, instance of flawed medical treatment and research, this medical myth has seeped into our current medical equipment and has devastating effects, which will be discussed later on. I'm going to move on to a more current instance of racial prejudice in medical treatments. I'm sure many of you are aware of the Tuskegee syphilis study. If not, it was a study focusing in the South on African Americans who had syphilis. It began in 1932 and ended in 1972. It was fairly recent and lasted for a while. Most of the participants were unknowingly part of this study. They believed that they were just getting their blood drawn for their health. Doctors wanted to use these African Americans as lab rats so they could explore the damage that syphilis had on a person. None of the unconsented participants were informed about their disease or received treatment and died because of it. This has turned into a wide distrust by marginalized communities in our doctors and research that are intended to help these communities. Now, before we get into our current situation with medical discrimination and how it is affecting society, I would like us to just take a quick look at the bigger picture. So I want to focus a bit more on one contributing aspect of racism that has led to healthcare inequities in our minorities. What I am referring to is redlining. Redlining was first defined and acknowledged in the 1960s. However, it started long before that. It is essentially a state-sponsored segregation. Basically, redlining is when a bank refuses mortgages to people based on their racial characteristics of where they live. Often, these neighborhoods are deemed not safe or risky investment, tend to be inhabited by minority groups such as African Americans or Hispanics. Now, you might be wondering, how does this tie into medical inequity? Well, I'm going to tell you. In these neighborhoods, there is somewhat of a cycle. These neighborhoods tend to be located near factories painted with lead paint or near factories that produce smoke. Actually, in fact, chronic illnesses such as breast cancer are more common for people living in redlined census tracts. In a study, it was determined that people living in these redlined census tracts nearly have a 60% increase in breast cancer mortality. What makes it even worse is that the, most of the hospitals that care for these communities are underfunded and not able to provide optimal care for their inhabitants, leading their patients to either seek more expensive treatment or not go to the hospital at all. Now, finally, let's get into what this talk is truly about, current medical discrimination and how it is affecting us. First off, there is a racial bias in our doctors and research in our medical system. Doctors have covert biases that stem from medical myths. Some of these myths develop very early on, such as the myth that black people feel less pain. Another myth relating to African Americans is that they are medication seeking. This leads to severe under-medication for pain, which can make a recovery process harder. One disturbing fact that I encountered in my research is that a black child is less likely to receive equal pain treatment for post-op surgeries, such as an appendectomy. Doctors in our healthcare system are not trained well enough to prevent these biases from affecting their behaviors. In fact, according to an article I read, the author of a journal article published in the John Hopkins University Press Doctors are more comfortable when it comes to treating white patients because it is who they trained with in medical school. Remember the first character from the talk? Well, sadly, postpartum deaths are not uncommon in the US. Actually, the US has seen an increase in maternal death rates over the past decades, and it is most significant among black women. This connects back to the medical myths we just discussed previously, and it's not just medical myths. Doctors' own ideas of race come into play when treating a patient. For example, in one article I read, an anesthesiologist refused to give a patient anesthesia as he thought she was on drugs because of her hairstyle. Their own prejudice and ideas of race and its characteristics affected their decision making. It's not just our doctors, it is also our medical equipment as well that has fallen victim to unfair racial bias. I would not be surprised if many of you had not heard of the EGFR, Estimated Glomerular Filtration Rate. I'll be honest, I first heard of racism and EGFR while watching Grey's Anatomy. Anyways, basically, the EGFR is a race-corrected testing of someone's kidney functions. For the test, doctors have a choice to choose. Is their patient black or white? This race question actually plays a significant role in the test 
if the patient is African American, the test adds more points to their kidney function, making it seem that their kidneys are much healthier than they truly are. This race correction stems from the myth that I mentioned previously, that African Americans have tougher skin. This test can make a patient not eligible for a transplant when they really need one. Another example of the race corrective machines are tests, uh, race corrective tests are spirometer machines in hospitals. Doctors again have a button they can press for the race of their patient and the results adjust accordingly. The spirometer lowers the results of lung capacity. This can make it harder for minorities to receive health insurance or pre-employment physicals since their lungs seem less healthier than they are. There are so many more disparities in our healthcare system, but for the sake of this talk, I only had time to discuss some of them. These disparities are increasingly developing as there are less marginalized doctors and researchers in the medical system. Research is typically developed and targeted only to white males, losing the trust of minorities when it comes to new medications. As I begin to close out this talk, I think it would be very beneficial if we briefly discuss some solutions that people in our community have been implementing and proposing. My expert, Dr. Lesko, worked with the CDC to implement programs program called DSMES, Diabetes Self-Management and Education, into our medical communities. DSMES helps create treatment plans for diabetes that are catered to a patient's beliefs, living situation, access to healthy food, and cultural beliefs. We need to get more underrepresented doctors in our medical workforce and in medical schools. To add, medical schools need to implement classes teaching students how to identify and fix racial biases that they might have. My dream is to hopefully become a surgeon and take the lessons I have learned while researching this talk to create an ideal customized patient experience for all. When I hopefully join the medical community, I want to educate my peers and fellow researchers about unconscious bias and be culturally sensitive to patients about their beliefs. I hope to establish outreach programs to facilitate equal access to appropriate health care for all. As a member of the Latinx and Middle Eastern communities, I feel especially compelled to do my part when it comes to reforming the healthcare system, not just for my future patients, but also for my family and myself. Thank you for listening.